Mystical Dynamite by P.G. Woodhouse, adapted for radio in six parts by Richard Osborne, and starring Richard Bryars as Uncle Fred and Hugh Grant as Pongo, with narration by Paul Eddington. Episode 2, Disturbances in a Country Village. A year has passed since Pongo Twistleton and his deplorable Uncle Fred, 5th Earl of Ickenham, were arrested at the dog races by P.C. Harold Potter and gave their names as George Robinson and Edwin Smith, neighbours of Nasturtium Road, East Dulwich. Now, the 5th Earl, having seen his dear wife off from Southampton to visit her mother in Florida, is sitting in a first-class carriage of the branch line train from Southampton for Ashenden Oakshot, Bishop Ickenham and Points West. I'm sorry, sir. Is that the force? Uh, quite all right. No damage done. Hi, say. You've got a lot of blood. Uh, yes, I've been abroad. Just landed. I'll leave this stuff on the seat if you don't mind. When you're going one stop. Of course. Uh, I say. Excuse me, sir. Aren't you Lord Ickham? I am. Fine. I'm pretty pleased with it myself. But why do you rejoice? You don't remember me. Bill Oakshot. Years ago, I was a friend of your nephew, Pongo, and I came over to your place to play tennis sometimes. Of course I remember you. Yes, <laughs> Bill Oakshot. You once tipped me five bob. That's how the money goes. And your wife, she once tipped me half a crown. You generally find that women loosen up less lavishly than men. It's something to do with the bone structure of the head, I believe. Yes. And how's Pongo? Very good form. He came into a deuce of a lot of money from a deceased godfather in America and can now face his tailor without a tremor. He's also engaged to be married. Oh, good. Yes, yes. Yes, you see, he seems fairly radiant about it. I must confess that I'm less enthusiastic. I was hoping Pongo would marry a different girl, a particular protege of mine. Among the advantages she possesses is sense enough for two, which is just the amount Pongo's wife will need. But it was not to be. No, they did get engaged, but then Pongo told me it was all off and that she'd handed him his hat, his letters and the engagement ring in that order. Oh, dear. What had happened? I haven't found out yet. But Pongo, being Pongo, soon got engaged to another girl. And you approve her? I hadn't met her. She sounds all right. He was always a pushover with the gentler sex. He was a Don Juan of the dancing class when he wore little Lord Fauntleroy suits. Oh, he'll chuck all that sort of thing now. Uh, let's hope so, but you remember what the fellow said. Can the leopard change his spots or the Ethiopian his hue? Or was it his skin? And talking of Ethiopians, has someone been cooking you over a small fire? Or did you sit in the sun without a parasol? I've been in Brazil. I'm on my way home from the boat. Ah, you live in this neighbourhood? Hmm. Ashenden Manor. Ah, not far from my place. Ickenham, I remember. Married? No. Uh, I live with my uncle. Or at least, he lives with me. But what's the distinction? Well, the manor really belongs to me. I was only 16 when my father died, and my uncle came bustling over from Cheltenham with wife and daughter and took charge. Ah. You'd think from the way he behaved that he owned the Bally place. For instance, he's converted the drawing room into a museum for his damn collection of African curios. Does he collect African curios? God help him. And who has the star bedroom? Me? No, Uncle Aylmer. Who collars the morning paper? Me? No, Uncle Aylmer. Who gets the brown egg at breakfast? Don't tell me. Let me guess. Uncle Aylmer? Yes, blast him. Ah. I suspect, Bill Oakshot, that you don't like having your Uncle Aylmer living at the manor. Right. Then why don't you bang him out? Well, um... I can't do that. <clears throat> there are complications. Well, tell me more. Bill sat gazing out of his window and saw only a vision of the lovely face of his cousin Hermione and knew that he would soon be seeing her again after three months in Brazil. And he wondered whether he would now have the courage to tell her that he loved her, had done so for nine years and wanted to marry her. Uh, 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 this stop, Bill Oakshot, is where you get off. Ashton and Oakshot. Uh, oh, uh, yes. Well, you better be girding up your loins. Oh, my God. Look at that. What Bill had seen as they got to the normally sleepy station was what might be called a sea of humanity, with at the forefront two men carrying poles with a placard lettered, Welcome Home, Mr. William. The eye was then drawn to a brass band, some boy scouts, a policeman, a clergyman, 
an assortment of villagers and what looked like an infant's Bible class carrying flowers. An impressive personage with a large white moustache seemed to be directing the proceedings. Bible class, stop bloody! Lord Ekenham saw what was happening. Bill Oakshot had blinched beneath his tan and looked like a stag at bay. Nip under the seat, Bill Oakshot. William! Where the hell is William? You can come out now, Bill. As neat a vanishing trick as I've ever witnessed. Like a performing seal going after a slice of fish. I must get a wash. Oh, thank you for your advice, sir. It saved my life. By now I should have been made to make a speech. Besides probably kissing all those ghastly kids with the flowers. Did you see them? I did indeed. And I have deduced that since you came to play tennis at my place and took our money in tips, you must have become pretty illustrious. I am myself a hell of a fellow, a first-class earl with documents to prove it. But have infants ever offered me bouquets? Never. What's all this about, then? I suppose my uncle must have got the thing up. That impressive citizen with a white moustache that looks as though it had been grown under glass? Yes. But what have you done to make him bring out a brass band and Boy Scouts? Well, I went on this expedition up the Amazon. Really? I thought you'd simply been connected with the Brazil nuts industry or something. Why did you commit this rash act, then? Wanted to get some girl out of your system, I suppose. Yes, something of the sort. I wanted to get away. Happened to see an advertisement in the Times about an expedition starting off for the low Amazon, run by a chap called Major Plank. Decided to sign on. Uh, sorry to stop the flow, but we shall be at my station, Bishop's Ignam, in a few minutes. Uh, what do you propose to do? Uh, uh, wait for the next train back? Well... Or shall I take you to my place, give you a wash and brush up and a strong drink, and send you home in the car? I say, wouldn't that be a nuisance? Not at all. That's settled, then. Uh, what are you going to tell your uncle to account for your non-appearance at his revels? Uh, By what I saw of him, he will demand a good, coherent story. Yes. What is he, your uncle? An all-in wrestler? He looked a dangerous specimen. He used to be governor of one of our crown colonies. Ah, tough nuts, these ex-governors. You didn't tell me his name? Bostock. Sir Aylmer Bostock. What? <laughs> well, I'll be damned. I knew him at school 45 years ago. Muggsy, we used to call him, younger than me. One of those chunky, beetle-browed kids who scowled at their seniors and bullied their juniors. <laughs> I, I, I once gave him six of the best for the fives bat for bullying a smaller boy. That sounds like him. I see it all now. Your welcoming party at the station. Muggsy is to stand for Parliament shortly, my paper informs me, and no doubt he thought putting on this show would impress the voters. Uncle to a man who has extended the bounds of civilization. That sort of thing. So that was young Muggsy, was it? <laughs> it must be 45 years. I'm wondering why you haven't run across him, living so close, Abby. Ah, well, Bill, I must tell you, it's my settled policy to steer pretty clear of my neighbours. Besides, Muggsy's is not an elfin personality. I doubt if Pongo knows what he's up against, taking on such a father-in-law. Well, it's Muggsy's daughter that Pongo has gone and got engaged to. Am I, am I? Oh, well, here we are at Bishop Sickenham. And there's Sims with the car. We'll go home, tidy you up, and calm you down with a drink. And we might find Pongo in a sofa, the old shack. He said he wanted to come and spend the night. <laughs> He's due at Ashenden Manor tomorrow to show the old folk what they've got coming to them for a son-in-law. We'll have to carry your bags to the car, I'm afraid. Sims, my chauffeur, thinks it infra to be seen on a platform. Luggage is for porters. We have a single porter, and he sees it as his job to polish the milk churns at the far end of the platform. Lord Ekenham, chatting away, had not taken note of Bill Oakshot's strangled exclamation on learning that his beloved cousin Hermione was now engaged to another, Viz Pongo. He had taken note that Bill had gone for his gin like a stag at eve. Well, good night, Bill. Oh, that was a man-sized gin you gave me. <laughs> I feel much better. <laughs> but I may try to sneak in at the back door of the manor so as not to disturb Hermione and her parents tonight. Well, I think Pongo said his Hermione was going to be in London this week. All right, Bill. Fine, fine. Well, thank you, sir, for all you've done for me. Goodbye. Pip, pip, Bill Oakshop. And Pongo had arrived at Ickenham in his sports car to stay the night on his way to Ashenden Oakshot. Coggs the butler had shown Pongo up to his room and was now serving uncle and nephew a good dinner. 
Well, Pongo, I'm awfully glad you blew in. I was wanting to chat with you about your plans and whatnot. How long are you proposing to inflict yourself on these Bostocks of yours? Oh, well, I thought about a week, uh, you know, then back to London. Really? Good, excellent. Your Aunt Jane left for Florida this very day. I will join you in London and we will have one or two of our pleasant, instructive afternoons. Oh, no, no, not another visit to the dog races. No, 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 not dog races again. Though I think we are both better men for the experience. Uh, Uncle French, just because Aunt Jane has left you for a few weeks, do you have to come up to London? It, can't you see it, Ekenham, and get ahead with a harvest or something? Uh, your aunt, and she's the dearest woman in the world, is a little restrictive. Her views on what I do, or would do, or should do in London prevent me from uh, uh, fulfilling myself. Living in a rural morgue like Bishop's Ickenham all the time, one gets rusty and out of touch with modern thought. Uh, 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 listen, Uncle Fred... All that stuff about instructive and pleasant afternoons is out. If you come to see me in London, you, you get lunch at my flat and afterwards a good book on the wireless. Nothing more. Oh, well, if that's the way you feel. But it is. Make a note of it on your cuff. I, I, I intend to stick to my resolve with an iron will. But my standing with Hermione is none too secure as it is. She looks askance at my belonging to the drones, and the faintest breath of scandal would dish me properly. And, worse luck, she knows all about you. My life is an open book. Well, yeah, that's right. And she's heard what a loony you are, and she seems to think it may be hereditary. She keeps saying, I hope you're not like your uncle, with a sort of brooding look in her eye. So that's the sort of girl she is, is she? Noble-minded, high-principled, a credit to British womanhood? <laughs> Rather, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's terrific. Right, I'll show you a photograph of her, actually. I've got one here in my pocket. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A striking face. Mm, yeah. Looks intelligent. And how, yeah, she writes novels. Good God. Why, don't you like her? Well, I, I can see she's a remarkable girl, but I wouldn't say she was a wife for you. Oh, I have not. In my opinion, you'll be giving away too much weight. That determined chin, those flashing eyes. What's the matter with flashing eyes? Dashed unpleasant things to have about the home, Pongo. To cope with flashing eyes, you have to be a man of steel and ginger. Are you a man of steel and ginger? No. You're like me, a gentle coffee caddy. Uh, how much? A coffee caddy is a man, there is no higher type, whose instinct is to carry the wife's breakfast tray out to her and to bill and coo as she wades into it. And what a coffee caddy needs is not a female novelist with a firm chin and flashing eyes, but a jolly little soul who, when he bills, will bill back like Billy Ho and will be right there with bells on when he starts to coo. The ideal wife for you, of course, would have been Sally Baines. Uh, th that's enough of that, Uncle Fred. I'd always hoped that you and Sally would form a merger. And then came the happy day when you told me the thing was on. And then, damn it, came another day when you told me it was off. Why? All your fault, I suppose. It wasn't anything of the valley kind. Sally was down here with her brother Otis a few weeks ago. Incidentally, she left in my charge one of the busts she had been sculpting. It, 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 that's it. There, over there, you see? On its stand in the corner. Oh, yeah. I couldn't get anything out of her about why you and she had broken up. She called me a lily-livered poltroon. Well, she probably meant it as a compliment. A lily-liver must be very pretty. High words ensued. And later that evening, the ring, the letters and all the fixings were returned to me by district messenger. I'd be a lover's tiff. And then there was more trouble when I, when I wanted Sally to give up being a sculptress. I hated her mixing with all that seedy crowd in Chelsea. Bounders with beards. I've been in her studio sometimes and the blighters were crawling out of the woodwork, bearded to the eyebrows. You appear to have thrown your weight about like a sheik of Araby. Well, she threw her weight about with me. We trying to boss me. You know, there, there's a limit and, and, and that customer's business was, was just the last straw. What business was that? Well, she wanted me to take some jewellery with me when I went to New York and smuggle it through customs. What an enterprising little soul she is. But since when has Sally possessed jewellery? Well, it wasn't hers. It was one of her rich American pals. I know, this, this girl Alice something had been buying up half Bond Street and didn't like the idea of paying duty on it when she got back to New York. Sally wanted me to run it through for her. A kindly thought. A fat-headed thought. A nice chump I would have looked being disemboweled by port officials. Well, I'm sorry. A wealthy husband as you be now would have come in very handy for Sally. I'm... I'm afraid the girl is on the rocks these days. Oh, I say. I know, I know. I don't believe she gets enough to eat. Oh, Lord. She seemed thin to me. I didn't like the way she tucked into the steak and kidney pie here, as if she hadn't a square meal for weeks. Poor little Sally. She's such a great girl. Yes. You still feel like that, do you? But, uh, you I, I'm still frightfully fond of Sally. In fact, I'm... <laughs> I tried to do her a bit of good just before I went to America. Hermione told me her father wanted a bust of himself to present to the village club, and I, and I, I got him to give Sally the job. Well, well, an impulsive girl would be touched by a thing like that. The whitest man I know, one can hear her say. You know, Pongo, if you would play your cards right, you could still marry her. <laughs> Aren't 
aren't you overlooking the trifling fact that I am engaged to Hermione? Slide out of it. <laughs> it's what your best friends would advise, Pongo. You are a moody, introspective young man. I shall never forget that evening at the dog races. Somber is the word to describe your attitude as the cop's fingers closed on your coat collar. You reminded me of Hamlet. Well, I... What you need is a jolly, lively wife. The sort who sets booby traps for the bishop when he comes to spend the night. I don't suppose this Hermione Bostock of yours ever made so much as an apple pie bed in her life. I'd give her a miss. For your information, Uncle Fred, wild horses wouldn't make me break my engagement. Most unlikely they'll ever try. I worship Hermione. There's nothing I wouldn't do for her. To give you a rough idea, I told her I was a teetotaler. Good God. And why? Simply because she one day expressed a hope that I wasn't like so many of these modern suction pumps always lowering a couple of cocktails for the tonsils. Good Lord. I tell you, Uncle Fred, until now, I have never known what love was. Well, you've had plenty of chances of finding out. I have watched you with the tenderest solicitude through about 57 romances, starting with that freckled child with a missing front tooth who blacked your eye when you tried to kiss her in the cloakroom. And now you end with this... Uh, this what? This gruesome combination of George Eliot, Bodice here and Lady Macbeth. This flashing-eyed governess. This 20-minute egg with whom no prudent man would allow himself to walk down a dark alley. Shall we join the ladies? There aren't any. Well, let's stop talking this ballet rot and go and have a game of billiards. Next day, Reginald Twistleton, Pongo to his pals, set out in his Buffy Pawson sports car for Ashenden Manor to present himself by appointment to the parents of the girl whom he hoped to marry. He pictured himself being cordially greeted at Ashenden by a bluff Sir Aylmer and a sweet-faced motherly Lady Bostock. He looked forward with bright confidence to grappling them to his soul with hoops of steel. Damn. Servants all out. To Pongo's right, there was an open French window. Pongo walked round and cautiously entered. It was the room where Sir Aylmer housed his one great joy, his collection of African curios. Spears, pots, masks, and primitive clay whatnots. Pongo picked up a piece, a sort of something executed in red mud by an artist apparently under the influence of trade gin. Reginald! When a voice, thundering from the hall, made him drop it. Ah. Reginald uh, Twistleton? Uh, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, Twistleton. <laughs> Reginald, you, you are Hermione's father? Hi, uh, hmm? glad to see you, Reginald. My wife will be down in a minute. Hermione's still in London. What are you doing here? Didn't you ring at the front door? I did, sir. I did, but uh, no, nobody answered. So I, I walked round to the open door here. Oh. I was just having a look at these um, uh, 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 objects. Ah. Took me ten years to gather this collection together. Mm. Every one of them priceless. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> British Museum would give its eye teeth to get its hands on it. This one, for instance... <laughs> then Sir Aylmer saw the remains of his priceless curio on the floor at Pongo's feet. God, Prime! How the... What the... Did you do this, Reginald? Uh, uh, y yes, yes. I'm so sorry. It was the jewel <laughs> of my collection. Wouldn't have sold it for a thousand pounds. Elma! Well? Elma, the vicar! Well? The vicar says that Mr. Brotherhood has developed measles mm. and he wants us to go to the vicarage to talk about this it. This is Reginald, Emily. Hermione told you about him. Who the devil is Mr. Brotherhood? Oh, you know, the curate. The uh, nice young man with the pimples. Uh, I was relying on him to judge the babies. Babies? What babies? The Bonnie Babies competition, dear. Uh. At the fete. Oh, it's terrible. Dreadful. I can't think who I can get to take his place. How nice to meet you at last, Reginald. Yeah, yeah. Ah, have you ever judged Bonnie Babies? Me? Certainly not. No, Emily. We don't want Reginald. I'll tell you who gets the job. William. William? Mm. Oh, surely the last person. He would hate it. That's why. No argument, Emily. Uh, it's William. Serve him right for not arriving at the station yesterday and going on the toot with old Lickenham. All the trouble I'd gone to for a welcome. William may have lost me the seat when it comes to the election. Yes, dear. I'll tell him, dear. Mm. Now, the vicar... Yes, yes, the vicar wants to talk to us. I'll drive you down to the vicarage now. Come on. Come on. Yes, I'm coming, dear. Uh, pip, pip it, then. <laughs> 
Pongo, disconcerted by the sudden departure of his host and hostess, waved them goodbye. Phew. Well, uh, better get back and try and tidy up the remains of that whatnot that I've gone. Ho! Oh. Only a policeman says ho like that. And a policeman it was. Harold Potter, who now represented the awful majesty of the law at Ashenden Oakshot. He'd bicycled up to the manor, hoping to be given a cup of tea in the kitchen by Elsie Bean, the parlourmaid, whom he proposed one day to make his bride. But seeing a furtive form, viz. Pongo, slinking in through the French window, Potter the Romeo became in a flash Potter, sleepless guardian of the peace. This looked to Harold Potter like a fair cop. Oh, gotcha. Oh, uh, hello. Oh, Elsie, I was hoping to see you. Who's this, do you know? Where did you spring from, Harold? And why did I hear you shouting, ho? A chap I've apprehended on enclosed premises. I say, what's all this about enclosed premises? Why shouldn't I be here? I'm a guest. And you, my dear old parliament, what's your name? Uh, Miss Bean, my fiance. Oh, really? The well, heartiest congratulations to you both. Pip-pip, Miss Bean. Toodle-o. I hope you'll be very, very happy. Y yes, that's as may be. But who are you? I've uh, seen you before, haven't I? Have we met? I've only just arrived. My car's round the corner. I am the celebrated Twistleton, engaged to Miss Bostock. No doubt the place has been ringing with my name. Miss Hermione is engaged to a gentleman named Twistleton. There, told you so. Of course I'm him. Look, on the inside pocket of my coat, a label by one of the best tailors in London and the name R.S. Twistleton. Oh, it could be someone else's coat that you bought second hand. Then telephone to Aylmer at the vicarage now and ask him if he doesn't know me. Well, I suppose it's all right. Um... Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Quite all right, officer. Then I'll be saying good afternoon. So, I feel we have met before somewhere, sir. Mm. Elsie, how about a pot of tea in the kitchen? Hmm? You can go to the kitchen if you like. Not me. Your sister's there calling on cook. Oh. Well, I think I'll mooch along and have a cup. Mooch away, then. You and your sister. Hiya. I say, don't you like his sister? No, I don't. And why is that, may I ask? What's the matter with her? I'll tell you what's the matter with her. She goes on at him about how he mustn't leave the force. It's, don't you do it, Harold, or don't let Elsie talk you into acting against your true interests. I haven't any patience. Am I right in thinking you don't want him to go on being a policeman? You want him to turn in his boots and truncheon? That's right. And his sister doesn't? Yes, I, I see. But, but, but why do you want him to resign his job? Why well, wouldn't you? If you was a girl, would you like to be married to a policeman? Feeling your old man was being hated by all. If I went home to Bottleton East and told my family I was going to get spliced to a copper, they'd have a fit. A nice thing for my brother Bert to hear when he comes out in September. Yes, yes, I, I, see, I, see, I see what you mean. Harold won a football pool last winter. I want him to buy a pub. But he's scared of that sister of his. Hello? What's all this mess on the floor? Uh, well, that's, that's what's left of a sort of um, African something that I dropped. Oh, does the boss man know about it? I'm afraid so. Oh, did he chew your head off? He's an overbearing dishpot. Uh, Lady Bostock seems to be less of a man-eater. Oh, yes, she's all right, but he bullies her. The best of them all is Mr William. He's their nephew. Ah, oh, yes, yes, that's forgetting Bill Ickshot. I, I knew him as a boy. Got a pink face, hasn't he? a tomato ketchup colour, I'd say. He's just back from Brazil. Oh, it sounds terribly exciting. They shoot birds with poison darts there, Mr William says. Birds? To eat? Oh, no, 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 you've got that wrong, young Bean. How can you eat a bird that you've just killed with poison? Now, now I read somewhere that they do it with slings, actually. Slings? Mm, yeah, what? They, they, they put a stone, uh, say, well, li like this um, paperweight, into a, a sling, rather like this uh, handkerchief, you see? There it is. Then they sort of Whirl it round their head like... Oh, my goodness, where did that one go? Oh, you are not breaking up the house. You'll catch it when his nibs gets back. Oh, dear. What, 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 what was it when it was in one piece? Oh, a sort of sawn-off statue-like. A bust, cook calls it, of his nibs. Oh, he thought the world of it. Oh, golly. This is a nice bit of box fruit. Um, well... Uh, 
Advise me, young Bean. What, 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 do I, what do I do for the best, do you think? Well, look, it's kind of dark in that corner, so maybe he won't miss the old bus for a bit. He's short-sighted, but he thinks specs make him look silly. So I'd advise you to jump into that car of yours and drive lickety-split to London and buy another bus there. You come back and stick it up, and ten to one, he won't notice nothing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Pongo saw that Elsie had given him splendid advice, but he wouldn't need to go to London. Only last night his Uncle Fred had shown him a similar sort of bust at Ickenham, the one Sally Baines had left there. Good. The Buffy Pawson could do the twelve miles in next to no time, and he'd be back, and the understudy back on the pedestal, before his nibs got back from the vicarage. Young Bean, good thinking. And meanwhile, you'll be doing a bit of earnest brush and pan work and remove all traces of this accident? Righto. Fine. Great. Careful. And I'll, 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 I'll race round for the car. Elsie, her brush and pan work accomplished, was standing on the steps as the Buffy Pawson came up. Pongo stopped to thank her for all her help. He reached for her hand. I say, you saved my life, young Bean. Not for you, I would have been in the soup and going down for the third time. Come here, I'm going to kiss you. Huh? Oh, cool. Pip it then, I'm off. In Buffleton East, where Elsie comes from, everybody kisses everyone, except please, like early Christians. However, in this case, Bill Oakshot had just come round the corner at the end of one of those long walks in which he tried to assuage his thwarted love for his cousin Hermione. And here was this smooth young man, Hermione's fiancé, kissing the parlourmaid. He was horror-struck. Elsie, wasn't that Mr. Twistleton? Yes, sir. Where's he off to? London. But he's only just arrived. Did he say why he was going to London? Uh, uh, no. He just said... I think I'll go to London. And popped off. Well, I say. Uncle Dynamite starred Richard Bryars as Uncle Fred and Hugh Grant as Pongo, with Simon Treves as Bill Oakshot, Charles Gray as Sir Elmer Bostock, Josephine Tewson as Lady Bostock. Policeman Potter was played by Chris Emmett and Elsie Bean by Teresa Gallagher. The narrator was Paul Eddington. Uncle Dynamite was written by P.G. Woodhouse and adapted for radio by Richard Osborne. The producer was Gareth Edwards.